Welcome, everybody. Anybody here for the first time tonight? Welcome, welcome. Welcome to anybody joining us on Zoom for the first time. I'd like to begin class by uh, introducing a topic that you uh, have the opportunity to discuss with each other a little bit uh, in service of against the stream being a place not just to meditate and learn about Buddhism, and, but to um, develop community and connect with other people who are practicing. It's a core tenant of Buddhism to develop wise friendships, what we call Sangha. Sangha, this would translate as community or fellowship or uh, something like that. I don't have a fully formed topic for tonight, but what I want to talk about is um, this aspect of life, of um, practicing Buddhism, of uh, that's just in this general way, not about being mindful or, but it's just about um, being a good person. And, you know, like even thinking about that, like, what's it mean to be a good person? And good, you know, we try to, in some ways, stay away from the duality of, of and the judgment of good and bad. Uh, my, you know, the Buddhist meditation instructions are uh, non-judgmental, non-judgmental awareness. But for this, uh, kind of general topic. I think it's okay to talk about being good, being a good person. What's that mean to you? What's it mean to be a good person? Um, have you had periods of your life where you weren't so good or, or aspects of your life where um, you're, you were unskillful or, you know, bad, bad behavior? You know, some of this we could kind of frame in, in Buddhist uh, ideas around karma, good karma, positive actions, wise actions, bad karma, negative, uh, unskillful, uh, harmful ways of behaving. What's it mean to you to be a good person is part of the reflection, and I'll talk about it a bit. Um, but I guess the second piece is, how good do you want to be? Do you have some reservations about being good? Is there some part of your mind that's like, so fun to be bad? So fun to kind of just like have an attitude and kind of give people attitude sometimes and not just be kind and loving all of the time. I mean, so satisfying to flip people off in traffic. I don't know how good I want to be if that's true for you. I mean, I'm not me, but for you. <laughs> how good do you, you know, sometimes I ask this question of like, how enlightened do you wanna be? How free do you wanna be? A lot of people come and check out meditation and Buddhism and some people come sincerely saying like, I'd like to be an enlightened being. I heard that enlightenment is possible and I'd like to experience that. I'd like to commit fully to wisdom, to compassion, to awakening. I think for me, you know, I've been teaching for a really long time. Um, a small percentage of the people that come to Buddhist meditation centers and retreats are seeking enlightenment. I think. I think that most people are seeking a little less suffering, mm -hmm. a, a bit of an a improvement in uh, the quality of life, a, a bit of. Um, a bit of transformation, but not looking for total liberation. And so maybe it's the same question, like, do you want to be, you know, because like the, the, maybe the definition of a good person, like really good, is the enlightened person who causes no harm, who's always compassionate all of the time, who's always loving all of the time, who's always kind and generous 
all of the time. And um, maybe that's not your definition of a good person. I'm probably giving away my talk as I keep talking, but I remember reading a, a book about Buddhist psychology um, from uh, Mark Epstein, one of his first books. And uh, he was, a, he's a psychoanalyst, but he really liked humanist psychology was his, his orientation. And uh, Winnicott is one of the uh, Rogers and Winnicott and these humanist psychologists who put all of this emphasis on, you know, when it comes to parenting, you know, children, like we need, uh, you know, the human development of children. We don't need perfect parents. We don't need parents that are good all of the time. We just need good enough parents. Atten you know, paying attention enough of the time. Not all of the time. No parent is perfect, you know, uh, probably. <laughs> but good enough so that the child isn't wounded and feeling, you know, not seen, but you know, good enough, most of the time seen. So is that something for you? I know for me, I kind of end up framing, uh, I don't know that I wanna be perfect, but I'd like to be good enough to not cause much harm. I don't have the sort of perfectionist, I'm gonna be an enlightened being and never offend anyone ever or cause any harm but more of a kind of like, I'd like to mostly be good and kind and it's my intention to be uh, a good person generally, but not a perfect person, good enough. With that humility that uh, understands that, yeah, sometimes we'll fuck up and be reactive or sometimes we'll be uh, impatient or self-centered or whatever it is and that good enough, not turning our, spiritual practice or our life into an unrealist expectation that I'm going to be kind, generous, loving, patient, tolerant, 100% of the time. My intention, be good, good enough, but also the humility that knows sometimes we're going to be reactive. That's why we make amends later. <laughs> That's why we have the forgiveness practice and the necessity of, of that as part of the quality of being a good person, quick to forgive, willing to forgive, to ask for forgiveness. So I've gone way too far. I'd like to encourage you to uh, break into small groups, talk to each other for a little bit about what it means to you to be a good person and what's your intention? How good do you want to be? So in the room, just make groups of like three or so and at home, I'll open the uh, breakout rooms and you can talk to each other about being a good person. As I reflect on this very broad, general idea of good, goodness, being good, the main uh, two things come to mind for me. The main is uh, what I've learned from practicing loving kindness, Buddhist loving kindness meditation of actually training my mind to be kind to myself and that kind of inner uh, kindness and uh, friendliness internally, uh, as well as bringing that not only to um, the people who are easy to be kind and loving to, friends and family, but also to strangers. And this Buddhist meditative training of uh, training our, our hearts and our minds to have loving kindness for uh, the unknown people, the people that we don't have any connection with, uh, sometimes called neutral people or this category of strangers, uh, the unknown masses sending loving kindness. And maybe uh, even more challenging uh, is developing loving kindness and being friendly, uh, at least in, in our heart, to um, 
our enemies to really difficult people rather than meeting unskillful, unkind, unwise, confused people with anger and hatred, uh, actually meeting them with loving kindness, training the mind to be kind, even towards ignorant people that offend you, rather than othering them and judging and hating, which is maybe more normal. So loving kindness um, as a quality of a good person. When I think of a good person, I think of someone who's kind. And then the other piece is the renunciation, the, um, the five precepts, practicing uh, nonviolence, the first precept of not killing, not intentionally causing harm to any living beings, uh, not lying or stealing, the honesty, the goodness, the integrity uh, of a person who chooses to not steal, even when you could get away with it. I watch my mind sometimes and... Uh, I think I forget, I forget, I don't remember exactly what it was, but where then my mind's just like, oh, I could take that. But I don't, I choose not to take that. Uh, Sebastian, who's working the desk tonight, uh, was speaking this weekend at a thing we're at, and he was talking about the first time he came to Against the Stream. His therapist said, go to Against the Stream, and <laughs> court ordered. And uh, all of the shoes back, this is on the, in Hollywood. And he said, I, would, he's, I just walked in, he's like, I'm like an active addiction. And I walk in and there's like 50 pairs of shoes in the, on the shoe shelves in the doorway. And my first thought was I could just steal these shoes and go get high. And I was just like, yeah, that's how my mind works too. Like I could just, and there's a whole bunch of Doc Martens and you know, like, wow, I could take those up to wasteland and be shooting dope in no time. Uh -huh. But part of the quality, you know, when I'm thinking of, of this is that decision to not steal and not to, to be honest and to uh, be, become trustworthy. Um, the precepts around you know, being careful with our uh, sexual energy, not to create harm and uh, misconduct in, in relationships and to be honest. And so, We'll talk more about this after the meditation, but for the meditation, since we're talking about developing goodness and, and becoming that good person that we want to be, I think uh, loving kindness would be the appropriate meditation for tonight. So I'll give what's called metta loving kindness instructions, and we can um, practice that and then have some dis more discussion after the meditation. Find a way to sit that's upright, but also relaxed. Allowing our eyes to be gently closed, taking a moment to release any unnecessary tension your body may be holding, softening the face, the, the eyes, the brow, the jaw. Letting gravity pull the shoulders away from the ears. Let your torso relax. See if you can soften your belly. And as we continue this reflection on goodness and kindness, on being loving, Begin by sending loving kindness to yourself. The Buddha's words were something like, wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. So direct that wish to yourself, may I be at ease. May I be at ease 
in this body, just as it is. May I be at ease with my mind, with all of its wonderful capabilities of thinking and planning and remembering. And all of, all of the, also, may I be at ease with the difficult aspects of our own minds, the self-centeredness and fear, the judging and comparing. You get the picture. We're wishing, we're training ourselves to be at ease with ourselves as we are, not ease as an easy, all of the difficulties going away. May I be at ease, we say to ourselves in this body that is subject to sickness and aging and death, with the pleasures and pains of existence, May I learn to be at ease. With both the pleasant and the unpleasant emotion. The joy and sorrow of existence. May I be at ease. Just as I am. And a couple of other uh, sentiments, aspirations that we include in the metta loving kindness practice, saying to ourselves, may I be happy. Maybe not the happiness of pleasure, but the happiness of, of goodness, of contentment. May I be happy with myself just as I am, knowing that I am good enough, worthy. And saying to ourselves, may I be free from suffering. In Buddhism, we come to understand that suffering is caused by attachment. May I be free from the suffering of clinging. May I learn to let go. Suffering is also caused by the self-centeredness. Uh, I, me, mine, orientation. Sometimes obsessed with our own thoughts and feelings. May I be free from the suffering of self-centeredness. So bringing these three aspirations together, slowly repeating to ourselves, over and over, may I be happy. And breathe it into your heart. May I be at ease. May I be free from suffering. When the mind starts wandering, thinking about other things, bring it back to the phrase. May I be at ease, just as I am. No need to think about that plan right now. Come back to here, meditating, developing the wise heart, connecting with your own goodness. 
May I be happy just as I am. May I be free from suffering. Most of us have to learn to love ourselves, to be kind to ourselves. And bringing this attitude to each other as well, training the heart, the mind to be kind, beginning to send a loving kindness to the people that you spoke to at the beginning of class your small groups and your breakout rooms. Just as I wish to be happy and at ease and free, extending these wishes to each other. May you experience happiness. May you be content with what is in your life. May you be at ease with your mind, your heart, your body in this process of aging, subject to sickness and the impermanence of death. May you learn to be at ease. And may you be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May you free yourself from the clinging and aversion, and the self-centeredness that causes you suffering. As we extend this love and kindness to each other with the wish for happiness and ease and freedom.
expanding to include the whole room, everyone here in person, everyone at home joining us virtually. The Sangha, tonight's gathering with loving kindness. Even though you don't know each other, that openness, that understanding that we're all wishing to be happy. That we all want to be at ease. This universal human healthy desire for freedom. Expanding further, think about the people that are in your neighborhood tonight. People here in Venice driving by on their way home or wherever they're heading, driving down Lincoln. With the stresses of life, the joys and sorrows of existence and loving kindness to all those people out there in the neighborhood, wherever you are. Your neighbors. Take a couple of minutes to think about the difficult people in your life that you perhaps resent or judge or fear. The people whose suffering and confusion has affected you in some way, their ignorance, 
their unskillfulness has caused you harm, perhaps. Or just the quite confused people in the world behaving in ways that are filled with greed or hatred, delusion. With the intention of seeing their pain, their confusion with compassion and the training of our own heart and mind to free ourselves from suffering at them. Extend loving kindness to the difficult people in your life or in the world. Trying to develop a friendly and kind relationship to confused beings rather than meeting them with hatred. Meeting them with compassion. Saying to them, may you be happy, may you find the healing that needs to happen to experience happiness. May you be at ease. And may you be free from suffering. Remembering that if our enemies weren't suffering so much, they wouldn't be behaving in such unskillful ways. They probably wouldn't be our enemies. May you be free from the suffering that is fueling your confused ways of being. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all living beings, those near and far away, those being born and those dying, the wise and the ignorant, the kind and the unkind, may all living beings be at ease, be free from suffering.
in the last couple of minutes coming back to yourself. The more we can turn towards our own pain and confusion with mercy and compassion, the more we can have compassion for others. The more we learn to be kind and loving to ourselves, the easier it is to be kind and loving to others. Sometimes the mind gets quite confused and feels unworthy or unable. To meet ourselves with love, with kindness. That's why we have this practice of training the mind, training the heart. The Buddha once said something like, you could search the whole world, all realms of existence, and never find anybody more worthy of love than yourself, more worthy of your own kindness and love. My partner, Lily, and I were having a conversation on the way over here tonight about um, about this, about, you know, are, are people naturally good? Do people have a, um, and so I'm going to ask you, I ask you to reflect, do you think people are naturally good? People have natural goodness in them. Uh, we, we started to talk about, um, like, is there a, inherent moral compass maybe moral is a not the right word all of the time but uh uh, inherent uh, kind of ethical knowing within us humans of uh, what is right and wrong and you know uh, skillful and not skillful um you know this is a big big philosophical topic um what do you think Uh, You know, you don't have to tell me, but just reflecting on. I actually don't know. Um, Buddhism teaches that there is the potential within all living beings. You know, even this meditative phrase, may all beings be at ease. There's the perspective that it's actually possible. There's the potential. Um, for all living beings, for any one of us, all of us, to um, wake up, 
to be become good people, <laughs> to be kind and loving and compassionate and, and wise, that it's, it's a part of the human potential. But that it really is a potential uh, more than a um, inevitability or a, a birthright or something like that. Like, um, I guess my own sense is that there's lots of diversity. There's lots of different, uh, you know, types of people and depending on the environments that we're raised in and come from. We were talking before class a little bit about kind of national conditioning from different cultures. And um, my sense is it does seem like there's some just like naturally really good people in the world. You ever, you know, you meet some people that are just like kind and loving and generous and patient and, and it's, then they're not like spiritual meditators or anything like that. They're just good people. Um, seems like that. I don't know if there's any enlightened people, but just that sort of generally, uh, you know, ethical and friendly there's some people that are just ethical, effortlessly ethical. <laughs> that are just honest, you know, for the most part, honest, and they don't lie and they don't steal and they don't kill. And, uh, and it's not like they have to try really hard, like some of us. I think I bring a lot of my own projection to uh, what it means to, to uh, be a good person and, and how Buddhism has taught me. Like I had to uh, I had a, so much to learn 35 years ago when I started meditating and I was not a good person and I was an active drug addict and I was violent and I was, I was in jail for drugs and violence and theft. And I started meditating and there was, there's no part of me or anybody that knew me that was like, yeah, Noah's a pretty good person. Everybody's like, that kid is a mess. <laughs> and he'll steal from you and he'll fight you and he'll, you know, it's like, so I had such a long way. And, you know, this is true for a lot of our community, a long way to go from, you know, the confused, ignorant uh, place that I was in when I hit the meditation cushion for the first time. And I started reading the Buddhist books. It's been a very gradual process of learning to be kind, learning to be honest learning to this meditation practice, loving kindness. I can remember the early times when I did loving kindness, uh, I didn't mean it at all. I'd say, may I be happy, but my mind rejected it. I didn't feel worthy of it. I didn't feel sincere about it. I didn't feel, um, I didn't even, it, didn't, it felt vulnerable. I didn't feel safe to be kind. Um, and it, took for, it was a process of years. Um, and I don't feel like I had much of a moral, this, this kind of circling back. I don't feel like I had much of a moral compass. That my wounds uh, were such that they'd been covered over so much uh, that uh, it was really easy for me to justify lying and stealing and hurting people and not feeling very bad about it. I felt justified in very unskillful actions for my, in my early life. Um, and then slowly over the years of meditation and sobriety and psychotherapy and trauma resolution and you know, all of the ways that I said, you know, I have a friend, and this is a diversion, but I have a, an, an old colleague meditation teacher. And he used to say, he said, you know, the spiritual path begins with the conscious or unconscious with the decision, I want to be a good person. He said, and then when you make that decision, I want to be a good person, then you say, okay, what do I got to do? I got to meditate. I got to live by some ethical guidelines. Now, I remember hearing him say that and not, not relating to it. I don't know about you, but for me, I don't feel like I decided 35 years ago sitting in that juvenile hall cell, you know what, I'd like to be a good person. <laughs> this sucks, I wanna be a good person. It wasn't formed that way at all in my mind. 
in my mind, it was just, I don't want to suffer like this anymore. This sucks. Is there any way to not live in this self-centered fear and addiction and, and suffering? And when I was introduced to meditation, it gave me a little bit of hope of like, okay, maybe this is a technique that can help excavate me from this fucking hole I've dug for myself. Extricate, I guess. Excavate maybe works. Um, and that it wasn't at all in the beginning a, a conscious, like, I want to be a good person. I was like, I just don't want to suffer so much. How can I not suffer so much? How can I get out of jail? How can I stop smoking crack? How can I change my, you know, how can I get out of this confusion I've been stuck in? And I don't know where that line was, but at some point, I think studying Buddhism and studying like, okay, we do the mindfulness. We do um, the loving kindness. I learned the forgiveness meditation early on, started to say to myself, I forgive you as much as I can, started to say to others in my meditation, uh, please forgive me for having caused you harm, not meaning it, not from like a sincere place, but from uh, my teachers told me to say this shit, so I'm saying it, <laughs> please, may you be happy, may you be at ease, may you go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> may you be happy, may you be at ease, may you be free from suffering. Slowly, slowly it becoming uh, authentic and, and sincere. And I don't know where that line was, but for me at some point, I did realize that my path to freedom from suffering, maybe, maybe I got brainwashed from all the meditation and listening to the Buddhist teachings and dharma talk i don't know but at some point i realized oh it is actually i do not just want to not suffer i actually want to be a good person because this you know amorphous thing about being a good person being ethical being honest being kind being forgiving being compassionate all of these qualities that i would assign to the good person these positive qualities these good qualities were exactly what was going to help me not suffer and not return to that earlier experience of suffering that motivated me in the beginning to come to meditation. And I, in some ways, um, I think, you know, my experience and a lot of our community's experience can be a bit extreme. Not everybody, uh, you know, does the kind of shit a lot of us did and and has the kind of confusion a lot of us have there's a lot of people who you know the first noble truth of buddhism suffering applies to everyone but not everyone becomes criminals and drug addicts and you know violent people that's not true about everyone everyone has some suffering so for all i think maybe the point i'm trying to make I don't know if this is true, but my sense is, I know for some of us is true, where actually we have to work a lot harder at being good people. It's a lot more intentional effort to not steal, to tell the truth, to be forgiving, to be loving, to be patient, to be tolerant. I do think that those are qualities that come more naturally to some than others. Maybe the equation is trauma, maybe. Maybe it's how wounded we were in our early life uh, that led to that lack of empathy and lack of kindness and lack of uh, goodness, natural, external uh, goodness. Might be that simple, but I, I, it's hard to say. So many different life experiences. After many years of medita meditation practice and, and recovery and such, um, I have come to a place and, you know, for a long time now where I do feel like there's a natural internal ethical compass where I used to be able to steal and justify it. And now even the thought of stealing feels like something that I recoil from. 
feels like, oof, ouch, I wouldn't want to actually do that. I mean, my mind might still give me bad advice occasionally. But I, you know, wouldn't, you know, even contemplating it feels like, oof, that would, I'd hate to have that sort of fear of, I'd hate to actually uh, cause harm in that way to myself. A, a greater sensitivity, a greater uh, internal uh, feeling of natural morality. Do you feel offended by the term morality? Some people do. <clears throat> Like it seems too religious. I think ethics is probably a better term, ethical or uh, I like I like to even just just integrity. There's a place where the Buddha says there's four types of human happiness. So there's the happiness of sense pleasures and material things. We all know that. We like our sense pleasures, we like our stuff, low level of happiness. He said the higher levels of happiness. Uh, as the happiness of um, debtlessness and blamelessness of integrity, of living our lives in such a way that we have nothing to hide, that we are, we're in integrity, that that's the real um, goodness that's possible, where we're living this life of blamelessness. Now, blamelessness and and even the good person model that I'm talking about, I don't know about you, but I'd like to think that Siddhartha Gautama, the, the Buddha, was like the best person ever. Like, what a good person. He like got enlightened, and then he spent his life sharing the teachings of enlightenment with anybody who was interested. He wasn't a dick about it. He was just like, here's how to practice mindfulness. And, you know, if you care about your happiness, you know, develop loving kindness for all living beings, and, you know, be generous, and be kind, and this open, loving, uh, generous teaching as a good person. And I uh, like to think of him as having full integrity, having compassion all of the time. And, but it didn't stop his community from having a lot of schisms, a lot of conflict in, in Buddhist community, even during his life. It didn't stop him from getting a lot of criticism. He was regularly attacked by people with different religious beliefs and philosophies. There was a lot of conflict and a lot of blame. Uh, the Buddha was uh, falsely accused of a whole bunch of terrible things because, well, I don't know if I know why, but because um, it's sort of human nature to attack each other. There's, there's some part of, uh, especially when somebody is saying something that threatens your belief system. You know, the Buddha was presenting a non-theistic approach to spiritual awakening in a very theistic culture. The Buddha, you know, it's that sort of, um, I like to see the Buddha as this sort of radical equality uh, teacher of, you know, like, uh, you know, sort of feminist, like he was empowering women in a way that had never been done in his culture. And he got attacked brutally for it. You know, for something that we would all, I, I'd hope we would all be like, well, that's just common sense, righteousness and equality and just, you know, but Sometimes, you know, when you're in a culture of ignorance and you say, everyone's equal, <laughs> they want to kill you. You know, and you say, we're not these bodies and the gender, you know, is not how we should be treating each other any differently based on gender they want, or race or caste system or sexual orientation or gender or identification, any of that stuff that we so blamelessness, the integrity of blamelessness of that sort of, I want to be a good person. And my own thought of like, wow, what a good person the Buddha was. Blamelessness does not mean that you won't have a bunch of conflict in your life. It doesn't mean that you won't be blamed. So sometimes it's talked about um, as blameless in the eyes of the wise. And that's a much better frame for us to think about. Like, am I acting with integrity in the eyes of the wise? Am I blameless in the eyes of the wise? Because the ignorant uh, hate the wise. 
right? The fascists hate people who aren't fascist. The ignorant hate people who aren't agreeing with their ignorant views. My sense of what it means to be a good person, I said at the beginning, some of it's um, renunciation. The five precepts, the Buddha says, you know, live by these five precepts. Now, some of that can be, maybe you're like me and um, you had to really learn this. It wasn't something that came naturally to you. Uh, some people, I think, hear Buddhism and they're like, this all makes such sense because I'm somebody who doesn't want to kill or lie or steal. That comes natural to me. Now, there, and then there, there's a, some of us who are like, oh, no, like killing and lying and stealing. That's like, that's, that's how I roll. <laughs> I walk into the room and I'm like, I'm going to steal those shoes. <laughs> And we have to learn to not do that. Like the kind of, it's a training. It's a renunciation. The five precepts are the Buddha's encouragement to training ourselves to not steal, to not lie, to not behave in ways that cause harm karmically to ourselves or to others. And then the... Um, meditative training, loving kindness, developing this practice of loving kindness, of compassion, of forgiveness, and of mindfulness. Mindfulness, I've got, for some reason, when I think of the goodness stuff, I think more of the heart practices than the wisdom practices. But there's, you know, we, we break our meditative trainings into two categories, heart practices, loving kindness, compassion, forgiveness, appreciation, equanimity, and developing those positive emotional states. And for and maybe it's my own bias, but when I think of the good person, I think of the positive emotional uh, intelligence. But then there's all of the wisdom practices of mindfulness, the four foundations of mindfulness and the ability to concentrate the mind, to see clearly that everything's impermanent, that there's a, an impermanent nature to all phenomena, all sensation and emotion and thought. And that because everything's impermanent, um, there's an unreliable nature to all conditioned phenomena everything that's internal and external. There's nothing really to, to worth clinging to, to rely on, because it's all impermanent. So we learn to let go. And the more we see the impermanent and impersonal or, or, or unreliable, then we start to see the not self or the uh, impersonal nature of things. And I feel like that's a, I don't know, about you, but I feel like that's a huge quality of uh, goodness, of learning to not think, take things personal, not take your own mind so personal, not take other people's mind or views or opinions or so personal, not clinging so much, taking it in so much. Uh, and I feel like it's mindfulness that leads to that wisdom of the impersonal nature of the human condition both ours and other people's. And you know what it's like to be around people that take everything personal all of the time. Not very pleasant. It's hard to be like, that's a really good person that takes everything personal all of the time. That self, really good self-centered person. So part of our desire to be good and the path to becoming that wise person is learning to see through the self-centered tendency of, of the human incarnation.
Now, maybe the, the last, kind of the reason this topic came up is because we were discussing, um, what it's like to practice Buddhism without necessarily believing in Buddhism. And I think one of the reasons I'm framing this as not like being an enlightened Buddha or a good Buddhist, but just a good person. It's nothing more annoying than good Buddhists who are really identified with like, I'm a Buddhist. And I'm a bit more spiritual than everyone else. <laughs> and I don't know, I feel like there's, um, for me, I think I even, people who are um, good for the sake of being good, rather than I'm being good because I want to be a good Buddhist, kind because that's a Buddhist thing to do, because my religion tells me to be kind but just naturally committed to, uh, and, and maybe it's that thing I was saying earlier about humanism, Buddhism as a humanist path, rather than I'm doing this because this is what the Buddhist teachings are. I'm doing this because this is what alleviates suffering in my life. It just feels like the right thing to do. It's not about religion. It's not about uh, the precepts or, uh, or the teachings. And then, I don't know about other traditions, but one of the things I appreciate about early Buddhism is there's this ongoing encouragement that you don't have to believe any of this. I feel like the Buddha was this really radical teacher who would show up and he would say, here's the four noble truths that I, you know, here's the path that will lead to the end of suffering. But then he would say, you don't have to believe any of it. You have to find out for yourself. You know, there's sort of like, I think that if you don't lie and steal and kill and, you know, act in harmful ways with your sexuality, he says, I think it will help alleviate suffering. Here's the teaching, but you find out. See if you can be happy while lying and stealing. See if you can be free while being unmindful. See if you can, you know, here's the path. He, he said, here's my direct experience. This is what led to my freedom. But you don't have to believe it. You know, there's certain parts of Buddhism that can be a little hard to swallow for some of us, like the stuff around reincarnation. Some people, oh, yeah, it seems like it makes sense. Some people, I don't know. I think I'll set that aside. Totally okay to set it aside. Not sure. Maybe we are in a process of rebirth. Some people are like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's not what's happening here. <laughs> Maybe. Personally, I think it's useful for us to have the humility to say Maybe rather than I'm certain for sure we're in a process of rebirth or for sure, no, that's complete bullshit. Doesn't make sense to me. So I decided it's not true. Sure. Maybe. Anyways, I feel like I'm out of steam. What uh, questions, comments, uh, do you have about this sort of general idea of becoming a good person and utilizing, I guess, you know, utilizing the meditations and the teachings on ethics that we have in Buddhism, not to become a good Buddhist, but to become a good person? Please, Kat. Um, this is sort of an academic question and kind of going away from where you're trying to direct this, but I'm That's curious, okay. yeah. I don't know, are there enlightened householders, or is that reserved for monastics? Nuns? Depends on who you ask, but in early Buddhism, uh, the answer is yes. That and and the Buddhas, you know, in in the suttas and in the early Buddhist teachings, um, he says yes. This path of awakening is available to householders as well as monastics. 
my sense is that uh, there's a kind of like it's a bit easier to do as a nun, uh, as a house, as a monk or a nun or a monastic. Um, the support that you get in the monastic system where you get to be a full time meditator. And, if, you know, and you have all of these practices of renunciation, there's a kind of it'd probably be a bit easier to experience full liberation in that sort of supportive sangha of monasticism than to do it as a householder. But it is said that it is possible for householders to also experience full liberation, um, but that it's harder for us when we're engaging. The, the last few weeks I, I did, uh, the topic was death a couple weeks ago, and then we talked about sex two weeks ago, and then last week we talked about money. And, you know, this process of trying to get free from clinging while engaging in sex, challenging to say, I'm going to have non-attached sexual connection but still a loving committed connection or you know much harder to be non-attached while engaging in sex than to be non-attached while being celibate i think is the perspective possible but you're asking for the advanced course if you're really going to go for complete non-clinging liberation in the midst of the most pleasant human experiences there are A little bit like trying to shoot dope and not get strung out. Maybe not the right example. <laughs> but it just feels so good. Um, so the you know the short is that yeah, it's 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 considered possible. Isn't that interesting? I don't know how you think about it, Kat, or other people. But as a sort of, we have our, our perspective of like, well, you know, we're just living our lives and we're in our relationships and we're working and we're, you know, having families or whatever we're doing. And we think like, you know, and I'm gonna use Buddhism to get as free as I can. And becoming a monk or a nun, that seems like really hard. Like never having any intentional sexual activity again for the rest of your life, not having any freedom of your own finances being completely, you know, in the Theravadan tradition, when you become a monastic, you renounce all forms of possession and you're completely relying on, and it's like, ooh, that sounds scary and challenging. You don't get to make any choices really, just what's offered to you. But from this perspective of liberation, that actually might be an easier way of life than this, where we're trying to, engage in this sort of tantric i'm going to engage in the world and in life and try not to turn it into suffering i'm going to try to engage in the most challenging aspects of the human experience with wisdom not renouncing them but engaging in sex and money and professions and you know families and relationships I tend to think that we're choosing the harder path. Even though mostly my mind would think, oh God, being a monk, that's got to be really hard. When it comes to liberation, this seems even harder. Please. How do you think karma plays into ethics? And in the sense, that it seems like there's these karmic repercussions to bad behavior, but unethical behavior I feel like that's almost a um, sort of a safeguard against um, swinging too far to the, to the left or the right of the we conduct ourselves. Could you hear the question at home? I don't know. I can't see if they can or not. Um, yes, karma. The thing about karma. Uh, is that it depends, you know, karma can ripen in the present. There's that instant karma. You lie and you feel, oof, I just lied. Or you lie, you steal and you feel like, oof, I hope I don't get caught. You feel afraid or, you know, there can be that. Karma can ripen in instantly or any time in the future. Now, like when I was reflecting on my early life, 
and the wounded situation that led me to being sort of in this antisocial situation where I could cause harm without feeling much guilt about it. I probably, you know, I was creating a lot of karma for myself, but I wasn't getting that. In like if I stole something and got away with it, I didn't feel bad. I felt elated. <laughs> I felt excited. I was like, yeah, I just fucking robbed those people and haven't got caught yet. And now because I just wasn't conscious enough to feel the, what the karma that I was creating, the fear that I was creating, uh, you know, I wasn't aware of it or I was thriving on the fear in some way. It was a rush, pleasant. And the teachings on karma is that, you know, that stuff that we are doing and not necessarily attuned enough that part of why I was trying to bring in this perspective of the moral compass, I wasn't attuned enough to my own ethics and uh, morality to feel what I was doing to myself karmically yet. It took some years of practice before I started to be like, oh, no, I don't want to do, I don't want to do any of that because it'll hurt me as well as others. Um, and I think it's part of what I was trying to point to of like, you know, some people don't believe in karma, but still choose to be a good person, not just out of fear of some sort of karmic <clears throat> consequence, but just out of that sort of like wisdom of like, I don't know if there's any karmic reckoning ever, but I still don't want to cause harm. You know what I mean by that? I feel like I, I put the people who don't believe in karma and are still honest and loving and kind in a sort of higher position in my mind than those of us who are like, well, I don't do it because I believe in karma. I remember one time years ago, I was with this Buddhist monk and when I was living in New York. So this is 17, 18 years ago. And he was visiting, he was a Buddhist Theravadan monk. And uh, I think George W. was in the White House. and. Um, I guess that, that timeline's probably, I think that's right. And he was talking about like what a terrible person <laughs> the president of the United States was. And somehow we got into this conversation about like, he said, if I didn't believe in karma, I would consider assassinating the president. <laughs> and this sort of that ethical kind of, he's like, actually, I think the whole world would be better off if this person wasn't in charge. And that like killing them would actually be an act of, compassion for many millions of people as you know iraq war and all that stuff was happening um he's like but I, he said the reason i won't murder is because i don't think i get away with it i actually believe in karma and you know like i wouldn't want to take on the karma of that sort of killing even though it seems like a really bad person <laughs> that needs to not exist so for him the belief in karma stops him from assassination attempts. <laughs> For the rest of us, we're just afraid of going to prison or, or whatever. Or, you know, some people are just like, yeah, I still wouldn't murder somebody no matter how bad they are. No matter how confused or ignorant or I wouldn't kill. Did I answer it? Yeah. Somewhat, some yeah. questions. But it all it all ties in, you know, in the traditional Buddhist system, it all tries ties back to karma. But whether we believe in that or not. Please, Lainey, maybe last one. I, I mean, I don't believe that humans inherently have a moral compass. And I also think that depend it's more of like you have the privilege of being in an environment where you can even consider whether or not you have a moral compass because it's situational. I mean, there's people that are good people, but like if they're stuck in prison, for instance, it's gladiator school. And so stuff that you do in prison, it's that somebody might say, oh, well, that's so terrible, but it's survival. And if you're like a mom that's got kids and you can't afford to feed them and you sell your body or you steal, what's, how do you say that that person is not a good person? And I believe that in the absence of certain structure, I believe that human beings do tend to become very base and revert back to like animalistic, you know, kill or be killed type mentality. Yeah. That makes sense to me too. I was working at um, T 
teaching meditation and doing, I actually did my psychotherapy internship at San Quentin 20 something years ago. And I was working, I was teaching these guys meditation and, uh, and doing some therapy with some of them. And uh, one of the, the big shot callers, one of the bosses, it really was getting into meditation and studying Buddhism. And we were talking about, you know, the, I was talking to him about the precepts and karma and nonviolence. And yeah, at one point he came to me and he said, um, he's like, I'm, you know, this stuff makes a lot of sense to me. He's like, but in this environment, you know, your example, he said in this environment, um, he's like, you know, I, I'm actually uh, not a racist but I have to stay with the whites or it's, or it's danger, dangerous for me. He said, and, and um, if um, he said, and if there's a riot, you know, if there's a fight and a race kind of, it's always racial lines pretty much in there. And um, he said, if I, and he's not, and he's big, it's like huge guy. He said, and I'm you know, one of the sort of leaders. He said, if I'm not out front swinging, um, my guys will get me later. If I try to sit it out, he's like, they'll, you know, I, I'll be in a lot of danger. He said, what do I do? He's like, I, I'd like to take a vow of nonviolence, but I live in this environment where if I don't participate in the violence, I will be subject to it. You know, I'll be and like ethical dilemma. <laughs> I was like, fuck, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to do in that situation. Um, I think that what I said was something like, well, you know, you could probably participate with like some level of harm reduction. <laughs> <laughs> so some level of like, you, you know how to kill people and you could actually, you actually also know how not to kill people. So, you know, like punching somebody, you don't have to, you know, is different than stabbing them. And so I'm sure that you could find a way to be in the violence with uh, <laughs> with less impact, you know. Okay, I'll try that. You know, yeah. You know how to kill people, and you also know how not to kill them. Probably. I don't know what a dilemma. Yeah, it does seem somewhat like a privilege for some of us to say, like, I practice nonviolence. Till you're in the Ukraine and you get invaded. Hmm, do I still want to practice nonviolence? Maybe not. So we'll leave it there for tonight. The Memorial Day retreat is coming up. Two weeks from two weeks from now. We have a three-night silent meditation retreat it's the annual retreat we've been doing it for i think i've been teaching it for 16 or 17 years every memorial day weekend it's a great place to come and uh, whether you've done retreat before just to kind of check in and get a few days on the cushion and in silence or if you've never done it and you want to come and, and sit a retreat for the first time that's a great intro uh, so either way you know kind of doing three days of silent meditation practice is good even if you're new and if you've been around for a long time, still what a great little tune-up to come and sit for three days. Um, there is room left, so please register. We, we got contacted by the retreat center today. Sebastian was talking to them and they want our final numbers um, soon. So if you're planning to come, please register soon. And uh, if you have questions about how to register or scholarship, it's all on the website but you could talk to me or Sebastian who will be at the desk to, if you have questions about that. I know a lot of you are coming and look forward to seeing you there. And uh, Jeff is reminding me that oh, today's Monday, uh, May 7th or 8th, May 8th. Um, on Wednesday, May 10th, it's the 20 year anniversary of the publication of my first book, Dharma Punks. It's been two decades since that first book came out. Um, uh, not that I'm going to do anything to celebrate it, but it's just interesting. 
that it's actually been 20 years since that book came out and it's still in um, uh, publication and people are still reading and teenagers are still like writing me once in a while and being like, that book was awesome till you got sober, then it got lame, but <laughs> love the drugs and violence and punk rock. 20 years. You know, I moved to Los Angeles because they bought it to turn into a film and it was, be, it was in production, you know, 18 years ago and it never happened. And I got stuck here with you people. <laughs> Not really. I love Los Angeles. So come to the retreat. Class is done by donation. Be as generous as you can be. May any goodness that comes from our practice be offered outward in all directions, shared with all living beings. May each one of us get as free as possible. And together, may we create a positive change on this planet.